many times. So 73, and the weight is 38 kilograms, very prone, small lady, frail, diabetic hypertensive, COPD, and uh, anemia, worsening breathlessness uh, from class two to class three, and ECG sinus rhythms, no major sort of conduction abnormalities, X-ray was normal, angiogram moderate disease, um, so we can leave that. Uh, and severe calcification of the aortic valve with the type 1 bicuspidal show the echo as well as CT in a second, and moderate pulmonary hypertension. And this is what we are trying to address now. We need to catch these patients earlier before they go into the stage of this pulmonary hypertension and uh, LV dysfunctions. So that's the 2D echo. Obviously, you can see the amount of calcification and the eccentricity of the opening. And probably this will show you better. Um, this echo on the left picture uh, clearly shows uh, the morphology. Uh, the echo images are nowadays is very good. Even without CT, you can see the raphes and the calcification and everything well. So that shows it's a type 1. And uh, this kind of type 1 I don't like very much. The right non-fusions are a kind of difficult, especially if you're a self-expanding platform operator, the right non is the one which gives a lot of trouble. So a lot of calcification. Uh, LV is reasonably adequate. So CT scan, I'll show the actual images. The perimeter is 71 and the area is 378. So area derived is 22, perimeter derived is also 22. LVOT is more or less same size. So it's a 22 diameter. And on the right hand side, the sinuses are wide. So it's 32, 27, 31. So the mean is around 30. Coronary heights are good. Both left and right coronary heights are good. STJ height is good. Now, we have increasingly started looking at the STJ heights more because the lifetime management becomes that when you want to do tab in tab, these STJ heights have become an important parameter, which we kind of did not make note in the past. Um, there is heavy calcification, the right hand panel shows. It's type one, it's completely calcified. Apart from that calcium, there are also nodules of calcium. And uh, on the right, sort of lower, you can see the amount of calcium extending into the LVOT. So it's type one, right non fusion, completely calcified raphe with calcium extension into the LVOT. Peripherals, reasonably good for self-expanding platform, for a balloon expanding platform, we might have some difficulty because this is a 4.5 to 5, and with some calcification as well. So small vasculature and also a ring of calcium in the infrarenal iota measuring about 6.5 to 7 uh, sort of diameter inside that uh, circumferential calcium. So just to highlight the Adverse calcium, you can see it in the right lower panel. Uh, it's more than sort of 15, 20 meter extension into the LVOT with more than 10 millimeter thickness of calcium. And uh, that is the anatomy. So I'll stop there and then we'll have some discussions before we proceed. The annulus. On the TV, it's a little, I can't read it here. Yep. Oh, the one you just had before, yeah. This one, yeah. Yeah. So the annulus perimeter is 71 and... Uh, 71 in the area as well? Okay. Okay. Sorry, it's going back. I'll just show you the area and perimeter. 378 and 71. Type 1 bicuspid. And, and we saw the coronary heights there. So any initial thoughts from the panelists? I mean, um, for sure, there's a huge calcium chunk when analysts and LVOT, which is, uh, uh, which is for sure uh, not, not very good. It's ominous, and also it's an NR fusion. So uh, we know that uh, this, right, these anatomies are more difficult to treat. You are expecting the valve to shift to the left-hand side. Uh, what if you are going to do a tower? So be be sure about the left coronary and be sure about the how the wire crosses at last. And and also, uh, what was the intercommercial distance? W were you able to measure it? Uh, Is twenty two, I think twenty two point three or something. All right, so pretty much similar to the analyst. So probably your sizing would be on that basis. But but first question, first surgery versus tower. 
uh, depending upon the risk, you would probably take a decision COPD and other stuff. If it is really that high risk, then mm. yeah, is probably more for surgery. That's what yeah, I think. Weight was 38 kilos. 38 kilos. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So yeah, COPD. High risk. Yeah. COPD. She seems inoperable. Yeah. So I mean, I think the valve, whatever valve we put, we are not going to get the optimal results in this patient. That's what we have to explain. I'll explain to the patient that uh, there will be probably a risk of PVL with whichever valve we place or risk of hematoma uh, or, uh, you know, other complications. VSDs can happen if you're aggressive oversizing. So, so my choice of valve would have been a self-expandable valve in this patient. Yes, a self-expandable in this particular case, look at the femoral vessel. She's a 40 kilogram patient. Last you want a femoral vascular complication in these patients. So now as we all start the IV program, you have to tailor the valve to the femoral vessels. So in this particular case, I have to go with the self expandable Yeah, no, I think from an annulus perspective, um, it could be uh, balloon expandable. You could do a 23. You have to be cautious. Um, the question of, uh, you know, use of TEE, and then we'll go to the final resolution. It, you know, I, I think these are type of anatomies, unless the patient can't be intubated and can't get a TEE, I, I watch on echo as I deploy these valves, because you have a calcified raphe, type 1 bicuspid, it's going to shift to the left, you can get root injury, um, and self-expanding is less likely of root injury, but you, when you post-dilate, you take that same risk, because and you, you get a better assessment of PVL, because you have, you're going to have to make decisions if you do self-expanding or balloon expandable. You know, when do I stop inflating for balloon expandable? Self-expanding, the PVL, um, do I post-dilate? How bad is the PVL? What is the risk benefit? And TEE guidance is going to help you. Um, and so if this patient can get a TEE, I personally would advocate because in the imaging information you get is, mm. in my mind, really helpful for decision making. So absolutely. In the United States, there's been a shift. Like, uh, obviously, uh, the tertiary and quaternary centers, which are now dealing with the compl complex tower patients, we have now started again going back to uh, TEE. TEE. So low risk patients are completely different. So I think, you know, once you, at, in India, you don't know, uh, you're getting this patient that uh, uh, the volume may not be that much and, uh, you know, not more than 200 in a year in your center. So uh, patient selection is important and the TE is probably better in this patient, I agree. And the vessel sizes are very small. Mm -hmm. So when you use balloon expandable valve in, the, in India, then you think about it. What is the 14 French E sheet yeah. will expand to? And what actually is the sheet of the Python sheet when it actually, when the valve goes through, right? It's preloaded. So Python sheet needs the, almost the six and a half millimeters or more, right? So maybe we can see the case resolution, just sort of the interest of time. Can we yeah. see what you did? So obviously, as most of the panelists said, the self-expanding platform will be safer in this situation compared to a balloon expanding platform for various reasons. And that's the sort of sizing charge with the Evolute. Uh, obviously, you can use a 26. There's a 14-person oversize. 29 will be a 27-person oversize. So I think 14, 15-person oversize with self-expanding is good. So the standard procedure, balloon tip wire, fluoroscopy guided puncture. And you take a nice, you can see the calcium extension going into the LV in the fluoroscopy as well. So crossing, wait for the jet to hit the catheter, cross it at that point. Now this uh, left-hand panel, uh, the pigtail orientation and position is not something you should accept in a bicuspid when you uh, sort of, especially after having the wire. So you see on the right-hand panel what I'm doing, I'm taking the wire in, I will bring it back to LVOT and get it down into the orientation where it is closer to the other pigtail and also it's facing towards the apex. If you accept the other position and if you take a self-expanding in that position, you will not cross. You will never cross in that position. So make sure that wire position is as it is where in the right-hand panel. And get into a good wire position here now. So pre-dilated first with an 18. Kept it a little bit higher, worried about that calcium extension in the LVOT. So rather than the 50-50, kept it around like a 60-30, whatever is 60-40. Um, saw that expansion, the valve was not crossing. So what to do next? 
upset. So mm. That was an 18 balloon. Yeah. I would be probably more aggressive with the balloon, I'll just probably snare, whatever. Yeah, so Ravinder was going to say something. I actually, when I bike cuspid valves, I always choose the not, uh, the mean of the uh, uh, annular dimension, Dimeters, so yeah. not the minimum diameter. Yeah. And this is exactly what, but in such cases in the past, we have upfront taken a Lundacrest wire because when you have a right and non fusion, the entry is very eccentric. Uh, at the level of under plane, you can use snares, multiple things to bring the valve on top of the opening. But first thing is you push a little harder and see if you can get into it mm. and try pulling the wire at the same time. But don't push too hard. Um, you don't want to damage that uh, nose cone. So it was tried. Now, as uh, Manik sir was saying, it is more of a slightly bigger size balloon, 20 pre dilatation with a 50 50. And with that, it went through. And it's a continuous movement from the thoracic iota to the valve and a constant pressure, that's what Ravinder was saying now, push it a little bit harder and that's it, it goes through. If it didn't work, yes, change it to lander quiz, if it didn't work, and get a snare, center it and get it in. So that's the way to do it, once you've done it, uh, that's the first uh, deployment. It will look very eccentric and as uh, my colleagues were saying, it will not look perfect on the fluoroscopy. So the first deployment was a little bit deep, so you recapture, you bring it up, it's bicuspid because you can accept a higher position. And the right hand panel shows that's how it looks. So at this point in time, the hemodynamics were satisfactory, reasonably satisfactory, uh, but still in one orientation, it looked constricted and the gradient was around sort of 15 plus. So this was a 22 balloon. Just opened it enough and the gradients was this. The mean gradient came down, 8 bar 3, uh, acceptable. And the ECG, there was no conduction abnormality, narrow complex. So for this patient, we got no conduction abnormality, no parabolar leak, no gradient, and a reasonably good stable position of a good sized valve. Uh, bicuspids, all of them are different, especially type 1 bicuspids are the difficult ones. They are difficult, and you need to see the RAFA. If the RAFA is calcified, CT-wise, as Sushil's group showed, it's tower unfavorable. We call it tower unfavorable because the 30 percent mortality with those cases. So tower unfavorable ones have a good reason to send for surgery. If they are really not a surgical candidate, then do it, but do it with caution and tell the patients with all the adverse outcomes you can sort of expect during the procedure.